Hello and welcome to the Disruptability Podcast. Today we're talking to Antonio Santos. Antonio works with ATOS and he is also one of the founders of Hashtag Access Chat, which is on Twitter every Tuesday. Antonio is a leader in disability business inclusion. He is a fantastic resource here in Cork, but also across the world. I hope you enjoy this conversation and thank you for listening. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Disruptability Podcast. I'm absolutely delighted this morning to welcome um, Mr. Antonio Santos here in Cork um, on our podcast. Antonio works with ATOS, and he's also one of the founders of Hashtag Access Chat, and he has certainly um, influenced me and challenged me with his writings that he's published on LinkedIn and he's kept me up to date with everything that's happening across the world in disability and accessibility. So welcome Antonio. Uh, th- thank you so much. It's, 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 it's quite interesting to connect uh, uh, and to link uh, within this space in, in Cork. I think we have a, a very interesting discussions to have in the city and especially to link with the international community uh, that works on the area of accessibility, disability, inclusion, that is always so passionate about the topics that they share. Absolutely. So let's start. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? You're working with Athos and you're on the transnational stage. So what do you do? So um, I work with a colleague uh, called Neil Millikan, who is our head of accessibility and digital inclusion. This is a, a uh, Neil works very close to uh, our human resources. So this is where uh, accessibility and this, uh, works uh, sits in our organization. So we promote uh, inclusion inside the organization and outside the organization. So uh, we were known a few years ago by working without email at work so we have we work as an internal social network and what i do regularly i share insights in relation to what's going on in the area of accessibility inclusion internally because uh, as you know um, uh, many uh, of these topics um, have a strong impact on day-to-day business and operations of our clients and it's particularly important that my colleagues uh, are looking at what is happening in this space because when the, when they are delivering software when they are delivering solutions uh, we want them to consider uh, accessibility from the initial stage of the projects and bits so that they can be in the better position to support the customers and sometimes to tell them well you should considering that you are investing so much here you should consider accessibility from the initial part of the project because this will save you time later and you are doing something that would provide more opportunities in terms of a customer base that might want to do business with you. Okay and do you feel that the knowledge base is out there now in terms of accessibility and inclusion? Well uh, internally I would say so because we are quite mature and like I was saying my colleague uh, is very close aligned with human resources so we build this within our organization well outside it it depends on the country some countries are doing pretty well and sometimes even is even about regions so we see very interesting work being done in the uk and in scandinavia uh, in some parts of north america in canada uh, uh, but but then in in south america in africa in other parts of the world where they are the the budgets and the resources are not as much as the ones that we have uh, here. We see people reinventing solutions and being creative uh, in very interesting ways. So uh, I uh, I see that I have I can confess that in the last five years we've seen a grow and an awareness about the importance of, of accessibility. So there's definitely something happening, and even even uh, people, and especially the media that were not really paying that much attention to the topic, are starting to capture snippets of information and trying to bring uh, people to events. So there's definitely something happening now. Uh, we are really far from achieving uh, 
uh, a level of uh, of uh, maturity and, and complete uh, awareness, especially because you know, people with disabilities are really, uh, most of them are still fighting to have a job, uh, are still fighting to have a place within orga organizations. So resuming, there's something happening, but we this is a, per, a kind of a permanent campaign, uh, something that we need to work permanently. Okay, you've touched on many issues there, but I'm just going to focus in on one because you said you mentioned different countries. Disability and its definition varies both nationally and internationally. Even within Ireland, whether you look at our Disability Act or our Equal Status Act, the definition of disability varies. How does that play out on the world stage, Antonio? Well, one of the uh, in one of the things that really uh, concerns me uh, most is uh, sometimes even when emojis and some some signs of graphic aspects, people when people look at disability, sometimes they see someone who has a physical disability. Oh, there's a, a, something that they, someone that I can identify. Uh, they don't really visualize someone with in a chronic with chronic pain or someone that is dyslexic or someone who has a learning disability because they don't see it immediately. And it, uh, the, the people with invisible disabilities are still discriminated because they still, sometimes they still have to prove themselves that that, that they have uh, that they have uh, that they have a disability uh, quite recently there was a few cases in the, in uk where uh, a, a young woman uh, who was uh, walking in the street uh, she was visually impaired she was and somebody because she was looking fine she because in the perspective of the person that was looking at her she didn't look disabled she was basically harassed and, uh, and asked why are you are using a can why you are you making that up no, no. There's still this uh, stigma against people who don't look disabled, and in some countries, that basically defines disability. You need to look disabled to be someone with disability. I know. There's almost like a pecking order, isn't it? You're not disabled yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cultural um, changes as well. You know, of, across borders. You know, the cultural attitude to disability and how it's dealt with in society. No, and I've seen that there are communities on social media that they are very keen, especially on, on Instagram, very keen about independent living. No, this is who I am. This is what I want to be. While they are sometimes other models across the European continent, oh, uh, where there are charities and organizations that somehow want to take control of the life of those individuals, uh, while sometimes they, well, they want to be independent. I, I can give you uh, an example recently that happened in, in, in Portugal, where a, I think it's, if I'm not mistaken, it was a 35 year old professional was living in a, in a, in a home. Uh, because uh, now, so during the day, he was successful. Is a successful professional. He has go, and then at the end of the day, he goes to a home, and he just wanted to live independently. So, uh, and he was fighting uh, within uh, his communities, within government, within policymakers, to find ways where people like him can have an independent living, mm -hmm. and having someone to go to to his home and to support him in the hours of the day that he needs. So there was this error, oh, there's here, let's say, let's just presume his name was Mario. Mario, uh, need, we need to take care of Mario. So Mario uh, needs to live at the home because we are mitigating the risk because he has a disability. His uh, opinion and his personality of being someone that wants to be independent was not really being much considered. Uh, because the organization will say, oh, we need to take care of him. But that's not really what he wanted. He wanted to be taking care when he needed that care. Mm -hmm. With the personal assistant. Yes. Um, Antonio, I've heard the same scenarios in Ireland um, in terms of people with spinal injuries, young people who are in nursing homes rather than in proper housing for their age group. And as you say, working, professional, etc. But the, the housing crisis here has really impacted on people with disabilities as well and independent living. No, I, I've seen cases and, and I'm, I'm sure that they exist all over Europe where people were in the home and then 
the activities that they do during the day is basically watching television. Is they are basically being entertained when they were being could be in, in situations of being educated or working or doing part time jobs. They have a you no. Know, they are not really encouraged to have a kind of a independent attitude in, in life and mm -hmm. with their surroundings. Or sometimes they are even isolated in a home that is far from anything else. So they don't really have a social life with other people from their age. Okay. With all your international experience, do can you identify somewhere that is best practice? Like where in the world is there best practice in terms of disability and accessibility? Well, the, uh, in countries like uh, Norway, uh, Denmark and, and, and Sweden, they are, they are um, and even you in, in the UK, in some areas, there are very interesting work being developed. I can, I can give you uh, an example of the, the government in, in Norway, where they have, uh, they have a department within government that takes care of uh, accessibility in the way how people experience the web or how uh, people experiences uh, services and access to business. So uh, this organization within the Norwegian government, they make sure that all the websites uh, within Norway are accessible. But they, they are very proactive in the way that they try to educate business to make their websites accessible. So it's not about punishing someone or finding putting a fine out there because the website is not accessible is about, okay, we identify a business where the website is not accessible. How can we help this business to make their website accessible to make sure that people can use their website and people with uh, disabilities can, can get in touch with them. So they have a very proactive way in order to, in order to, to make sure that they engage with with organizations who don't really sometimes have the knowledge uh, within house like a small business they might not have really have the resources so they engage in a positive way with them to make sure that the websites uh, uh, the websites are, are uh, accessible uh, as, uh, while in north america they have more the american disability act so where you can be sued if your website is not accessible. so there's two extremes okay mm -hmm. There's two extremes of, of the situation. Uh, so one, uh, the European, where there's a level of uh, empathy and proaction uh, around the business, and in, in North America, well, where you can be sued just because you are not respecting the rights of a, uh, of, of a group of individuals. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. On the, I have also seen in UK a very interesting work being done on creating um, uh, accessibility uh, on, in business. So there are organizations like the My Purple Space from yes. Kate Nash and My Disability Forum who do a very interesting work with business, with business practices, with networking, permanent a permanent dialogue in discussion about the, the best practices on disability and inclusion within society who are actually creating change. So uh, those are a few examples that I've, I've seen and really uh, have made uh, the difference. Okay, well, I think that's, sorry, just to interrupt you there, I think that's really interesting. I, I prefer the Norway model than the USA model because once we start legal action, you bring in fear, you divide people, and that is not the way to move forward. So the Norway model, I like that, that they're giving the supports to the business. They recognize that there is a gap. Because Antonio, making your website accessible, like it's not, it's not brain surgery. Like, I mean, it's not huge. Like, I mean, we've put people on the moon. So why can't? No, yeah, I agree. Yeah. But, but, I, but I, can, I can give you a, a, an example. No, we, we do ACC Access Dublin for a few years now, an accessibility hackathon that you know, that focuses on accessibility and mobility with, with, with disabilities in Dublin. And sometimes we have young developers joining the hackathon. Okay? They, most of them, they know nothing about accessibility. They never learn how to code or how to develop in that space. But once they realize what is at stake, they, start, they realize, well, I need to learn about this. Yeah. So I need to go back and I need to find someone that can fill the gap in my knowledge. And sometimes within a business or when we have an agency or someone that is designing a website for you, uh, 
if you just tell them th that you want the website accessible, they, I'm sure they are going to find a way to make the website accessible. Sometimes it's just that they're not paying attention. And then if they do that from early stage, it basically there's not really much on the cost of it. You know? mm -hmm. The cost is not really an issue. There's plenty of uh, open source solutions, plenty of uh, 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 libraries out there mm -hmm. that they can use just to build the same website uh, that is accessible and everyone can experience. Is the guideline WCAG, is that enough for websites? Say if you're going into businesses in Ireland and you're saying being accessible, is that uh, the best guideline to follow? Well, that ticks the box, okay? Uh, uh, I think it's interesting to, to work, uh, to look at work of individuals that, that uh, like, I think he's Aidan Pickering. Uh, he has, a, a, I think he's Aidan, his Twitter handle is Aidan Works. People who, who follow the guidelines, but they go an extra mile in terms of design, in terms of using techniques that are even, that create even a better experience. Mm -hmm. So I think the guidelines, they tick the box, but, so that, but that's what they do. And there are individuals out there that have, were able to find ways to create even better experiences because the, so they sit in many of those of those groups that define uh, uh, the, that define guidelines internationally, but they go the extra mile in terms of, of design because sometimes the complaint that that exists in relation to accessibility. Oh, uh, if if I follow the guidelines, the, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not able to do that. It restricts my creativity, and that's not true. So people like Aiden prove that that's not true. So there's plenty, a good number of individuals that I can give you the, the information later that were able to go beyond the guidelines. Good. I'd really appreciate that because um, the businesses that I'm going into want to be leaders in inclusion so we want to go beyond guidelines and i suppose get behind the spirit of the law the spirit of the legal instruments and um you know really not just say you're inclusive but be inclusive you know walk the walk as well as talk the talk true yeah um the united nations convention on the rights of persons with disabilities ireland has signed up for it portugal has signed up for it Europe, as an entity, has signed up for it. Ireland has not signed the optional protocol. How do you feel about that, Antonio? Well, uh, in fairness, there's no excuse for that, you know? Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> what can you say? There's not what really, can we say? <laughs> yeah, there's not really an, an, excuse, an excuse for that. You, uh, you, because you know you should you know treat everyone equally uh, so what i think some some countries have, pro have proved that this can can be done ireland is one of the richest countries in the world you know uh, other countries uh, out there with less resources have signed it and have put uh, in place. I think it's important to understand that uh, sometimes you don't really need to be perfect in the beginning, but you need to understand that you are in the journey and you need to commit that you are going to evolve over the years. But it's really important to give this sign to society. To society. So it's a bit of a disappointment uh, no, that it was late. Ireland signed that with a gap in relation to in relation to, to other countries. There's plenty of technology companies in Ireland, uh, plenty of organizations that, uh, you know, works from companies like uh, like uh, uh, Microsoft have doing a very interesting work in, in, in this space, especially in the area of software. They are based here. Uh, they, you know, companies like uh, even, you know, WordPress, uh, Drupal and, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, no, the, there's no from the technological side there is no no excuse i understand from uh, a space of accommodations and considering that we're the housing crisis it puts some pressures in in other in other areas but i think it's, it's particularly important for politicians to commit with with every citizen and not have first class and second class individuals 
Exactly. And um, a few months ago, you recommended I read a really good book. It was called The Longevity Economy. And I absolutely gobbled it up. And I mean, anyone who is in um, technology business, well, just in business anywhere in the Western world with the aging uh, population, they need to read this and really think about the innovations that we need to move forward with in accessibility. Yeah, it, sometimes people tend to forget that the uh, the most uh, age is one of the main factors that relates with disability. Now, uh, if you if if you are um, older, if you are on their sixties, uh, so you might have some kind of impairment or disability through you through life, and Europe is uh, um, one of the oldest continent, you know, especially countries like. Uh, Germany, Portugal, Italy, and even Canada, and particularly Japan, where uh, uh, the aging populations uh, are, are growing and will tend to grow, is particularly important to, to adjust every, everything around you to, to the needs of, of the age of the aging population. Mm -hmm. And you know, we can, you can actually look at Japan as an example considering that they are in the stage where many of other countries will be will be in the future so japan provide an interesting stage of development in what you need to do and the challenges that you are facing when you have an aging population absolutely and um, and the fact that it's a market you know i mean it's a an open market for the future and um, you just mentioned earlier hack access are you going to bring that to cork you're in Dublin. Well, Cork, in, fact, <laughs> in fact, I had a, I had a few uh, conversations to bring uh, uh, access that we have done in Dublin over the last couple of years to Cork. Uh, uh, I had a few conversations with with, with a few people, uh, but the re the reason why it haven't happened yet is actually because of personal personal time. I, I realized that. Uh, in the day that I wanted to do it, I, I, w I was basically traveling or moving back and forth. So in order to do it here, I really need a, a, a team of people in order to make it happen. It's, it's not really difficult to, to do. When we started the event in Dublin, it started really small. And the idea was to basically to bring the community together and to let people to know each other and have some fun for two days. It's basically a way to explore the, commu the, the community in Dublin. And then on the second year, we improved a lot. And then on the third year, uh, we, we really did something really uh, interesting, especially with, with compared with the years before. So it's definitely something that we need to do in Dublin. I think this is the right time to do it. <laughs> and what did you do that was interesting in the third year? Well, uh, on, on the third year, we got really a, a very interesting commitment from the Dublin City Council. So they were there, they were involved, they were collecting information, they were engaging with the winners, trying to see how they can apply some of the learnings uh, within, the, within the Dublin City Council. They, they were particularly engaged with, with everyone. They were meeting the, the participants, they were meeting, they, they, were, they, were, they were somehow part of the community. And that was extremely valuable because one of the things that we want to do is, is to show people what we can do and then we want them to engage and we want them to keep them engaged. So changing the way how people see uh, uh, what can be done to improve uh, things within within mobility, within uh, design, within website design was particularly important. So it means that we're able to achieve some level of change in terms of how people look at, at what we are trying to do there. Okay, well, look, tech for good, I'm on board. You're right, you have one person on your team anyway, <laughs> and I, I know a number of people who would love to bring this to Cork, Antonio, seriously. Um, I mentioned earlier that you're one of the founders of Hashtag Access Chat. Do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about that on Twitter on Tuesday nights? Well, um, a, a few, almost, say, five years ago, my, um, I was doing some research on accessibility, uh, inclusion, uh, diversity, social inclusion. And I was trying to identify who out there in social networks 
was having a kind of a conversation on the topic, not just about sharing content, who was trying to engage with other people. And I found Deborah. Great. Deborah Rue, mm -hmm. so who I never met, I came across, and so Deborah was trying to engage in some conversations, and then I uh, I emailed Deborah and say, Deborah, you know, you are trying to do something here, but what are you exactly trying to do? And she, oh, can we have a call on on Skype? So we had the call on Skype, and she told me, well, Antonio, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to talk with people on this topic. So why don't we? put together because I was at the time I was already doing another Twitter chat that is now known as work trends so I told her so Deborah, why don't we use the model that myself uh, that Megan and myself use on work trends and do something similar within this space oh that's a good idea so I get in touch with my colleague Dil Milliken who knew Deborah from some some W3C uh, meetings and we and we, we had a few calls and we decided to structure ourselves uh, uh, within the Twitter chat. So every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, Dublin, uh, 3 p.m. New York City, we do a Twitter chat on accessibility, tech for good, in inclusion, uh, where we have a guest and we have six questions that everyone can answer. So, and we are doing this, you know, in December, we'll be celebrating five years of regular Twitter chats. Uh, we never stop over the years. So even for holidays, we are, we are always there. Uh, even if sometimes we know that during Christmas and those times, we'd, we don't might not have a guest, but we are paying attention to that hour if someone joins. Uh, you know, our first guest was David Ford Williams from the, from the BBC, and our latest Get, uh, yesterday we were talking with uh, with Paul Smite from the from Barclays, mm -hmm. who runs accessibility at Barclays, uh, where you know it's it's an, a very important area for the bank, because having a bank that is accessible and friendly, uh, it's good for business, yes. and also helps to bring family members to open accounts in the bank. So it's part of the core values of Barclays. And Paul, Paul was always a strong supporter of, a, of Access Chat. But we had uh, you know, actors uh, from Star Wars. We had um, from, um, personalities, models. Uh, a, few years, a few years ago, we got an email in our inbox from a guy called Stephen Fry, and they called me. Oh, uh, somebody sp with the under um, somebody might uh, is using the name of Stephen Fry to reach us out. We need to see that because we were say, oh, maybe it's a spam a spam email. Well, and then we realized it was really Stephen Fry, <laughs> uh, and, and it and it told us, oh, no, I, I no, it's interesting what you are guys doing. I wouldn't mind to be on Access Chat. Okay, so we are all up to it. So we, uh, Stephen Fry, we, it's our call to fame on Access Chat because he reaches mm -hmm. us out to be on Access Chat. So it's a, it was a very interesting, it, and that we're, quite, we're happy on that one. We're having Stephen and we realize, well, we are reaching people. Oh no, so, you sure are. No, and like yeah, it's such a great yeah, platform yeah, as well on yeah. Twitter, it's so accessible for people. Yeah, so we realized that we're doing something uh, interesting. So we're really happy. It, it was a very important moment for us uh, because we do this in the top of our jobs. So we're really happy for seeing that happen. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. And you know what's great about social media is it, I suppose so many people with disabilities can be isolated, but the great thing about social media is it brings the conversation right into your home, right to where you are. Yeah, and... and Something that we have seen to to on access chat is we we know that there's a a number of people who actively engage, who are very active, but others they are just observing and reading, mm -hmm. and and sometimes after the chats we receive emails, uh, we receive private messages where people talk with us about about the topic. They do that for many reasons and. Uh, Sometimes people who are employed, but they don't want to signal their employer that 
they care about the topic because they don't do they might have um, some disability or, or some condition and then don't want to signal to their employer that they are in that type of conversations and not really just people that just they just prefer to read instead of acting instead of joining the conversation mm -hmm. and that's fine as well you know everyone needs to choose uh, what what's work uh, for them and being part of the conversation yeah disclosure is still a huge um, issue in ireland i don't know about the rest of the world but it's still a huge issue in ireland yeah, we we've seen you no know, going back to the work being done by kate nash and business Business Disability Forum. They have done a very interesting work in that area in, in the UK by working with business and creating a, an environment where employees are um, encouraged to disclose. At the same time, they do a lot of work with human resources to make sure that uh, people get the support they need once, once they disclose. So we are we have internal networks that support our that support my colleagues, organizations like the BBC have the, those support networks, Microsoft has them. So there's a good number of organizations who encourage employees to disclose and then they they provide them the technology that they can use. There's also other organizations that by default, they provide technology, and then it's up to individuals to use that technology uh, or not regarding disclosure. Sometimes this is a very interesting way of working because if you provide software solutions that are available to everyone mm -hmm. that support dyslexic users, no, you know, it, the, the, the software is available, you just have to use it. Or even when you do uh, a, an assessment, a desk assessment, if you provide solutions uh, to, to have a more comfortable workspace, uh, some people will feel accommodated just by the, with, the, with the, what the assessment provides. Mm. But that's not enough. There's always someone that would need a little more than that. So, the, but I think that there's, there are interesting ways for business to do that in a subtle way where people can feel, uh, you know, don't feel that they have to disclose, but feel still feel accommodated. Mm -hmm. And there are others who create an environment of disclosure where people feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's, uh, examples of, of both sides that organizations need to learn but in the end this is all about organizations uh, letting people to feel uh, let, letting in their employees being able to be themselves at work and that's the most important thing so if an organization is able to create an environment where everyone is able to feel themselves this goes across disability LGBT or any other area so yeah. you are creating a positive environment that uh, people can basically be who they are exactly and be able to go into their job and be themselves because we're not one dimensional you know like yeah. it's not just oh i'm claire who's vision impaired you know there's a lot more to me than the disability that's just yeah. one yeah. element of my life you know and it's the same with many people um do you think that the organizations engage enough with the public services you know like we've got a lot of supports and grants in ireland around like a wage subsidy schemes and work equipment adaptation grants and grants for training and disability awareness do they engage enough to make the most of these schemes i don't think so sometimes i see a, a kind of a divide between private and public sector they live in two different uh, uh, worlds. Uh, I, I was in the event yesterday in, in Cork that I engage quite frequently on healthy cities. Um, um, I, I was probably, it was me and another person who worked for the private sector. You know, everyone else was somehow w uh, working in around the space of the public sector. You know, NHS, uh, councils, so and we, we we had this debate before how to find ways to be more engaged with the private sector because in some areas the private sector is already leading the way yeah. already provided alternative solutions that they are not even being considered by the by the public sector and it will be a great advantage to bring everyone together to communicate about what each other are doing and and i'm almost sure that that will most likely 
lead to government to review some of the practices. Antonio, I am so glad you brought that up. I am, I've worked in the public sector for 18 years <laughs> and I jumped ship and I am now self-employed and going out into a private sector and it's another world. It is another world. Sometimes at the beginning I felt like an alien, you know, going into private sector. Now I love it because you know what? They'll say it and then they'll do it. Whereas sometimes in public sector, there's so much bureaucracy and nobody really has the power to move the conversation forward. And you're like, come on, you know, it's like a big ship and you try to change direction and it takes a long time to change direction but i do think there has to be a partnership between private and public for it to actually for the conversation to move forward in any meaningful way no no i i i, I agree and because uh, you you have amazing people in the private sector uh uh who uh, no what we are doing uh, uh, work uh, in the, in their organizations who have that ability to like you're saying to execute uh, faster and and sometimes you know, b because they don't have so many constraints they, they're able to 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 have more work done but at the same at the same time we have fantastic people in the public sector that want to do things but they they somehow end up being and you know with all the bureaucracy with all the, the, the limitations about what you can do w w within the public sector uh, they are not able to deliver what they really want to deliver it's not a question of don't want to do it is it's almost they are in a kind of a trap that they're not able to get out they know what needs to be done but there's not really much they can do as individuals no i agree completely because there are constraints of you know different schemes and, and everything is constrained so the ideas are good the will is there the heart is there but sometimes we're working in um well what i see is that it's a bit still old-fashioned you know like we're in 2019 i mean with accessibility and software and everything else that you've been talking about i'm going to finish up um antonio by giving some advice that is on your linkedin profile and if you don't mind, it's advice. <laughs> well, it's, I, I work a lot with students with disabilities. I've recently been doing some work with the National Council for the Blind of Ireland. And I suppose the whole idea is to get people with disabilities, especially younger people now, get them work ready. And you give advice on your LinkedIn profile. And I just thought it was brilliant. So I always say, this is from Antonio Santos. Number one is stay flexible. Two, adapt to change. Three, develop your skills. And I suppose I've really taken that on board. This time last year, I didn't know how to use Zoom or do podcasts or anything. So develop your skills. Four, appreciate diversity. All diversities, that, that's huge. Keep up to date, brand yourself, and make connections. I think you're all about networking and meeting people. And we even just talked about bringing the, the hackathon here to Cork. Be on the vanguard. And most of all, follow your passion. Any, any more to add to that, Antonio? <laughs> Have I embarrassed you enough now? <laughs> no, I, I, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm, one of the things that I enjoy, that, that I enjoy the most is uh, uh, connecting uh, people. And and some and some are stepping out of the way, you no, know, into uh, finding people that I feel well. Uh, someone here needs. To, person A needs to meet person B. And then I, I really enjoy do, to do that. So I, I tend to work on that outside work and inside work, because we have an organization with around, around 120,000 people uh, all around the world. And, and we have projects happening all the time. Uh, and sometimes, um, because of distance and, and geography, people don't connect. But sometimes you are in the middle of so many projects that you realize, well, maybe A, this person here should meet that one. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this, I, I do exactly the same on Twitter when I have the opportunity and I see two people who are 
not in the same networks that I, I feel that they should meet. I just do those introductions. I really like to do that. <laughs> And it's such a simple idea. It's just, um, as you say, people talking, communicating, connecting, you know, and I mean, even if it's virtually, get the conversation true. going because you just never know where it's going to lead to. True, true. I know, uh, just, uh, uh, I'm sure you know uh, Caroline Casey from Valuable. Yes, I do. I'm a big so, fan. So, so we on Access Chat, we are one of the supporters of Valuable, my organization side of Valuable 500. Mm -hmm. And just this year, I, I was, um, Caroline told me, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to California. Uh, and, then, and then, well, maybe there's someone that I can introduce you there. So, and then I went, well, you should, I went to Twitter and I talked with my with a friend of mine called Mia Down, uh, who is doing a, compiling a list of influential women in artificial intelligence and in the technology world. And I told no, Mia, Caroline is doing this. She's going to California. You should meet. And then that's what I know. When Caroline landed in San Francisco, she was able to have a, a coffee with, with Mia because somehow the work that they are doing is different but collides in some aspects. So it will be value, valuable for both of them mm. to meet uh, and, uh, and uh, find ways where they could collaborate within their networks. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, we're big here in Inclusive Cork. We're big fans of um, the Valuable 500 as well. And I would love to get, we've got a lot of companies in Cork who um, employ more than a thousand people and they are already doing work, a lot of good initiatives on disability. And I'm like, you're well placed. Join the Valuable 500. Get on the world stage in terms of disability business inclusion. It's absolutely a no-brainer, you know. And so hopefully... Great. Cork will be a leader. <laughs> That's my plan. So, Antonio, we might finish up there. And I just really want to thank you for your time this morning and for coming on and talking to us um, about disability and accessibility. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you soon. Okay. Cheers. Please be advised that this recording does not constitute medical or legal advice.